Hello and welcome to The Witness podcast here on the BBC World Service with me, Louise Hidalgo. And today I'm taking you back to late December 1979, when the world held its breath as the Soviet Union sent its army into Afghanistan to prop up the country's communist-led government. Moscow said the troops would stay six months. In the end, they stayed nearly ten years and Afghanistan would become the Soviet Union's Vietnam. Vyacheslav Vesmailov, who served in Afghanistan as a soldier, and journalist Andrei Ostalsky have been remembering that time. I was taking my things to go home after my evening shift uh, when I was summoned by the task director general, Mr. Sergei Losev. It was late on December the 24th. Andrei Ostalsky was in the Moscow headquarters of TASS, the official Soviet news agency, when his boss got a call from the Kremlin. And he told me in great confidence that in a few hours' time the Soviet troops would enter Afghanistan and a big military operation in support of the Kabul government would start. And he ordered you to stay at the office that night, didn't he? You couldn't tell anyone. You had to collate all the reaction that was coming in from, from abroad. But you were really quite junior at the time, weren't you? to have access to news like that. Yes, so I was astonished to learn much later from the memoirs of the chief analyst of the KGB Foreign Intelligence Service that even he was taken totally by surprise. That night and the next day and the following day, December the 26th, thousands of Soviet troops entered Afghanistan. For the past two days, some 200 Soviet air transports, the large Antonov-22 and the smaller Antonov-12, literally poured into Kabul, carrying the equipment... Far away, in the Soviet Republic of Dagestan, a young teacher heard the short official announcement. His name was Vyacheslav Ismailov. The Soviet army always seemed to be fighting somewhere and there was so little information. I just remember that we were told we were helping these people, the Afghans, and our soldiers would be defending them against bandits, that's what we called them. And they were going to rebuild schools and hospitals and roads. There was no mention of military operations. Back in Moscow, meanwhile, at TASS, Andrei Ostarsky had been temporarily put in charge of the Afghan news desk as the agency scrambled to find experts who spoke the Afghan languages, Dari and Pashto. And you had this hierarchy of information, didn't you, at TASS? There was the uncensored news that wasn't for public consumption, of course, but you'd sent it to the Politburo and other senior officials. And one day um, they asked you to go and brief these local party officials, didn't they? Uh, Yes, yes. Uh, I was uh, telling them that uh, Hafizullah Amin, the Afghanistan's president who was murdered by the Soviet commandos, and then the Soviet Union started supporting the minority faction inside this minority, led by an alcoholic of an KGB agent called Babra Karmal. So the USSR was relying on this minority in one of the most troublesome countries in the world. So you told the party officials this, and um, their reaction wasn't quite what you expected, was it? The audience was totally shocked because uh, it contradicted uh, everything they were reading in the Soviet newspapers. So they started jeering and heckling, and I had to cut my talk short, and I was scared. I ran. I physically ran back to TAS, asked to see my bosses, and said, I am afraid they will denounce me, and you will sack me, or maybe I'll be arrested. Well, I was totally panicking, but they said, OK, we'll try to do what we can, and they did. But they didn't want to know the truth. The Soviet leaders also didn't want to know it. That was a, a learning curve, I must say. The war ground on. Six months turned into a year, then two, then four. Afghanistan had become a Cold War battleground, with Moscow and America fighting through their proxies, flooding the country with weaponry. By 1985, the Soviet Union had a new leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was beginning to realise it was a lost cause. And it was getting harder to hide the body bags bringing home dead Soviet soldiers. That year, Vyacheslav Ismailov, who joined the army a few years earlier, was sent to Afghanistan. We flew to Kabul, which I remember being very dirty, and then to Shindand Air Base in the west, where we were based. 
When we arrived, we were given a lecture by one of the senior officers, and afterwards, when we were having a smoke, he said, "You know, the way we're fighting this war is going to be going on when our children, our grandchildren, are old enough to fight." That was when I began to understand it was going badly, and it was so different from everything we've been told. The next day, Vyacheslav was traveling in a military convoy when they passed an Afghan driving a truck loaded with watermelons. One of our officers stopped the man and commanded the van and started throwing all the watermelons out to our soldiers. Ten, twenty. Thirty, and the Afghan was sitting there shaking, saying, "Please, please, this is my livelihood. That's enough." And I remember thinking, "We're not bringing peace to this place. We're occupiers. This is how occupiers behave." Your battalion wasn't in a combat role, was it? Its job was to take supplies from the airbase at Shindan through the mountains and the desert, four hundred kilometers to Afghanistan's second city, Kandahar. Tell me about that journey. We'd set off at first light. We weren't allowed to travel by night, although sometimes we had to. The hardest was the third day going into Kandahar. That was the most treacherous part. They were waiting for us. There was a grain store, and once you got past that, the gunfire started. It was like a firing zone. Our forces in Kandahar tried to cover us, but sometimes we got hit. Then we'd have a day's rest, and. We'd set off again. What was the most difficult thing? Is this? Oh, it's hard to say. It was on top of you all the time. I was in charge of four hundred men, young eighteen, nineteen-year-olds. You have to feed them. You have to look after them when they're wounded. Make sure their weapons are working properly. You're just thinking about them all the time. But you knew what was going on, didn't you? Villages were being bombed, civilians killed. You know, fields and valleys were being mined. Yes. Oh, of course, I knew. I, I knew when our forces hit a column of Afghans. It, it was like when the Americans hit the Chinese embassy in Yugoslavia. You know, we did the same. Our planes dropped bombs on hospitals, on villages. It was collateral damage. Some days they wouldn't let us out of Kandahar for two or three days, and all the roads were closed because the planes were bombing. But what can you do? It's a war. We started it. We had to see it through. The hardest thing he found to bear was the fact that one in four of the Soviet soldiers killed in Afghanistan weren't killed by enemy fire; they were killed by their own side, or they took their own life. Or it was fights that ended badly, or it was pilots going out drunk and crashing their planes, or colliding with another plane. Our leaders were always talking about our achievements and our heroism, but really, we were our own worst enemy. And suicide. You mentioned the high rate of suicides. Did any of your men take their own life? There was one instance of suicide under my watch. We were on our way to Kandahar, and a young lad was with us, and he went a wall. We found his weapon; he'd left it behind, but he'd taken a few grenades. And the following morning, we found his body、uh, ripped apart, and a note. I still remember every word, and it's more than thirty years ago. I'm a coward. People like me don't deserve to live. Please tell my mother that I died a hero. He was eighteen. The last Soviet troops withdrew from Afghanistan in February 1989. Fifteen thousand Soviet soldiers and one million Afghans had died. Two years later, the Soviet Union dissolved. Vyacheslav Ismailov is today a military analyst for the Russian newspaper Novaya Gazeta. Andrei Ostarsky went on to work for the newspaper Izvestia and then the BBC. Today he lives in the south of England. Both were talking to me, Luisa Dalgo, for witness.